When you imagine a city, what do you see? I see the predominance of cracked grey concrete and black pitch, litter strewn amongst alleys and drains, monuments to man's hubris scraping the skies, patches of foliage struggling to survive, hordes of metal rushing up and down weary roads, telephone and power lines obscuring the sky, and an ever-present haze of exhaust in the atmosphere, and in the faces of each passerby. What sounds fill your ears? I hear the constant rumble of idle engines, the neum of Russian traffic and blaring horns, the clamor of construction, the hiss of buses and trucks, the sirens wailing to get past the gridlock, the flapping and cooing of abandoned generations of pigeons, and the footsteps of those that scatter their foraging. What do you smell? I smell the sickly scent of gas, oil, and urine, the fumes of tailpipes, the rot of garbage and waste, and the sizzle of street foods. I walk along uneven sidewalks, I deny contact with well-worn railings, and I use my elbow to press crosswalk buttons. Sometimes I'm jostled by a slow-moving crowd, other times I'm jaywalking through standstill traffic. I find it easy to find my bearings, but difficult to not feel small not feel consumed by the overbearing heat, the overpowering miasma, and the overwhelming sense of metropolitan decay. At night, you can't even see the stars. Cities may simply be defined as permanent human settlements of clear boundaries and notable size. You may find kinder iterations in some corners of the globe, where walkability and superblocks reign supreme, but you will also find more grotesque manifestations in the form of expanding slums and car-centric sprawl. Cities are a concept in constant flux, shaped by millennia of human habitation, but it feels as though a very specific form is taking hold worldwide. If one were to take a reading of current common sentiment, one may find the city defined as hell something anti-human and corrosive to our imaginations of spatial possibilities by sheer force of its pervasive unimaginativeness. It is dull and life-corrupting. Over the horizon, some cities may be nice to visit, but not necessarily nice to live in. Others are neither. Few are both. Yet nearly all feel nakedly built on the foundation and desires of private capital, not the best interest of the people. So on weekends and holidays, many people seek physical and psychological reprieve from the hell of the city, which can take the form of escape and visitation with the paradise of nature. They are well-understood opposites. I mean, you could choose urban or you could choose rural, you can't choose both. In this narrow vision, there is no best of both worlds, and in some manifestations, the suburbs may be considered the worst of both worlds. But I won't retread that desire path. The topic of the suburbs and other aspects of city planning have been covered quite well by the likes of Eco Gecko, Not Just Bikes, and Alan Fisher. If the rise of urban planning YouTube and core core TikToks are anything to go by, people yearn for more from the city. After all, the city is here to stay. But the city as it exists right now in much of the world leaves so much to be desired. My question is, recognizing the radical potential of the right to the city, how can we approach city planning through urban struggle in a cooperative, co-creative, ecological and egalitarian fashion? In other words, how can we build a solarpunk city? Before we can delve into the principles and practical components of solarpunk city development, we must first grasp how cities came to be and how they evolve in a modern context post-industrial revolution. Early cities developed naturally out of the growing population of agricultural societies, typically along floodplains and river valleys. In the dawn of everything, Graeber and Wencrew confronted the assumption that early cities necessarily corresponded with the rise of states. Our social organization is often seen as determined by scale, egalitarianism in the small scale and hierarchy in the large scale. After all, we interact with our friends, family, and neighborhood very differently than we do nations and metropolises, because we evolved to navigate society on a small scale. Or so it's said. Ancient and modern, cities are exemplary of large-scale societies. But such societies may not be as foreign to our evolution as we may initially assume. As it turns out, a lot of people don't like their families that much. 
Modern hunter-gatherers, ranging from the Hadza in Tanzania to the Australia in Martu, have been found to reside in groups that contain less than 10% of their own biological kin. The moieties of Aboriginal Australia and clan systems of Native America also created bonds of kinship between non-biological kin, even if they had never met before. There's also some indication that this may have been the case for our ancient hunter-gatherer ancestors as well. It does not contradict our evolution to align ourselves with strangers and work together to create cooperative social systems. Foragers may exist in small groups, but it seems they've always existed in larger societies. As Graben went and grew and pack over the course of chapter 8, despite initial archaeological evidence in Egypt, Mesopotamia, China, Central America, and elsewhere indicating the correspondence of cities and states, we found that in some regions, cities governed themselves for centuries without any sign of the temples and palaces and concentrations of wealth that would indicate stratification. In others, centralized power seems to appear and then disappear. Urban life does not necessarily require any specific form of political organization. While having so many people living in one place may vastly increase the range of social possibilities, in no sense does it absolutely predetermine which of these possibilities will ultimately be realized. However, what has been realized in urban life today bears the markers of a mass society. A society in which bureaucracy and impersonal institutions have replaced genuine social bonds, leading to social alienation. In 1800, only about 2% of the world's population lived in urban areas, but that number has grown to modern estimates of over 50%. In 1950, only 86 cities around the world had populations of 1 million people or more. Today, that number of cities has passed the threshold of 600. According to American urban theorist Mike Davis, this marks the rise not of urban Edens, but of a planet of slums. Not inevitable, but created by specific colonial, post-colonial, and neoliberal policies that have pushed people into such circumstances and enforced racial and socio-economic inequality. Many of the cities developed post-industrial revolution seems to demonstrate the narrow-minded management aims of the capitalist factory par excellence. Goods and people being semi-efficiently transported along the easily legible lines of the grid, natural streams, waterways, and forest undulations and landscape obliterated in favor of canals and roadways, historical and marginalized communities carelessly uprooted or split by the latest highway expansion, common spaces reduced to nodal points of traffic, and all as the commodity reigns supreme. These cities consume both people and place. Hundreds of millions of acres of land have been buried under concrete and steel to feed the ever-growing sprawl, and as American social ecologist Murray Bookchin noted, to feed the immense populations that are absorbed by the cities, agriculture too must be industrialized, which is achieved by spraying crops with harmful chemicals, saturating the soil with inorganic fertilizers, compacting it with huge harvesting equipment, and leveling the terrain in the countryside. All of this feeds into one of our greatest ecological crises. As cities have expanded, they've joined with other cities, creating an ever-growing expanse of megapolis, best seen in the urban behemoths of the Takedo Corridor in Japan and the Boston-Washington Corridor of the US. The burden that this way of building cities under this socio-economic system has placed on the natural environment is equally staggering. With such exhausting urban food and energy demands, Noise, air, light, and water pollution disrupt weather patterns and poison the biosphere. However, it should be noted that size is not necessarily the determining factor here. Smaller urban areas can create as much or even more problems for the environment compared to larger urban areas. Much of what determines the extent of environmental impact of an urban population is the house of living. How people get around. How people consume and deal with their waste how people build their homes, etc, etc, etc. A large city with mixed-use zoning and a robust and effective public transit system will likely have a lower environmental impact than a smaller city that is entirely reliant on cars to get from zone to zone. Regrettably, one of the base assumptions of this socioeconomic system is that there can be no limit to growth, economic or urban. As climate breakdown continues, We must confront this assumption if we are to take a different approach to city planning. 
But what precisely is city planning? In essence, city planning is a process focused on the development and design of land use, water use and infrastructure, particularly transportation, communications and distribution networks. Ideally, city planning should effectively answer questions about how people will live, work and play in a given area, accounting for their transportation, utilities, health and more. However, despite the lofty humanitarian goals of many city planning projects, which, to be fair, has had some successes, the field is also rife with failures, largely due to the precedence of capitalist interests and the exclusion of those most impacted by city planning decisions, the residents themselves, from the process. There have been many iconic city planning visions over the years, some controversially realized, such as Brasilia, and others left to the realm of imagination. One of the most influential of these utopian visions spawned its own 20th century urban planning movement, the Garden City Movement. The English Georgist and city planner Ebenezer Howard's Garden Cities of Tomorrow, published in 1902, painted an idealized city that married town and country, creating a union to spring a new life. He sought to combine the benefits of town's opportunity, amusement and good wages with the country's beauty, fresh air, and low rents. Though strongly influenced by the works and ideas of American socialist Edward Bellamy and Russian anarchist Peter Kropotkin, Howard wasn't particularly concerned with the social, economic, or political causes of urban misery. His urban vision was mainly focused on how the design and structure of the city itself could alleviate urban poverty, overcrowding, poor ventilation, pollution, disease, and separation from nature. The focus of the Garden City design was a compact, urban entity of about 30,000 people engaged in manufacturing, commerce and services, surrounded by a green belt to limit urban sprawl and provide open land for recreational and agricultural purposes. All the land in the city was meant to be held in trust and leased occupants on a rental basis. However, Despite the aims to preserve natural beauty and potential to stimulate greater human contiguity, Howard's vision lacks a sufficient confrontation with the structure of capitalism itself. Rather than advocating for self-management and a change in how we relate to the means of production, garden cities simply ignore the battlegrounds of class that engender our urban environments. Garden cities also lack the vision of face-to-face democracy seen in the Greek polis, nor any of the radical mechanisms of political involvement seen in the Paris Commune. What Howard misses is that cities under capitalism are spaces of vast income inequality, time disparity, and alienated labor. Though a necessary component in promoting community, changing the design and layout of the city alone will not change that reality. In the end, the Garden City vision leaves us with a bitter taste of compromise with certain aspects of capitalism and the state, much like the ideology of Georgism as a whole. As Bookchin writes in The Limits of the City, Howard's Garden City does not encompass the full range and possibilities of human experience. Neighborliness is mistaken for organic social intercourse and mutual aid. Well-manicured parks for the harmonization of humanity with nature the proximity of workplaces for the development of a new meaning for work and its integration with play, an eclectic mix of ranch houses, slab-like apartment buildings, and bachelor-type flats for spontaneous architectural variety, shopping mart plazas and a vast expanse of lawn for the agora, lecture halls for cultural centers, hobby classes for vocational variety, benevolent trusts or municipal councils for self-administration, Indeed, the appearance of community serves the ideological function of concealing the incompleteness of an intimate and shared social life. Key elements of the self are formed outside the parameters of the design, by forces that stem from economic competition, class antagonisms, social hierarchy, domination, and economic exploitation. Although people are brought together to enjoy certain conveniences and pleasantries, They remain as truncated and culturally impoverished as they were in the metropolis, with the difference that the stark reality of urban decay in the big cities removes any veil of appearances from the incompleteness and contradictions of social life. The problem with city planning that we must confront is that city planning alone is not enough. In fact, it can reinforce the very mindsets and systems that we seek to abolish. 
Historically, city planning arose in part as a response to capitalists' utter inability to not generate unsanitary, inefficient, and uninhabitable cities in their pursuit of profit. However, city planning has still been largely limited by the destructive social conditions to which it was a response. The utopian visions once presented by city planners have been muted by a lack of political will to see them implemented and a pragmatic mentality of capitalist society which deals with the facts of life within the parameters established by said capitalism. Cities will continue to reflect this society until this society is fundamentally changed. Only egalitarian relations can produce egalitarian space. Until city planning embraces a radical critique of hierarchical social relations, it will forever remain a servant of those relations that continue to produce our urban crisis. One form this radical critique may take can be found in French Marxist philosopher Henri Lefebvre's 1968 book Le Droit à la Vie. In other words, the right to the city. Recognizing the generalized misery of everydayness in a city run by bureaucrats and bourgeoisie, escaped only by the consumption of commodities, the right to the city is a call to action to reclaim the city as a co-created space for a transformed, renewed, and self-managed urban life. Complemented by the right to difference and the right to information, the right to the city should modify, concretize, and make more practical the rights of the citizen as an urban dweller and user of multiple services, who should have access to the city in common and without stratification. Quote, the right to urban life, to a renewed centrality, to places of meetings and exchanges, to a rhythm of life that allows the full and entire use of these moments and places. The right to the city according to Brazilian academic Marcelo Lopez de Souza, is the right to full and equal enjoyment of the resources and services concentrated in cities, something that would only be fully possible in another, non-capitalist society. However, this alternative cannot be birthed from state power. As Lefebvre notes, the incompatibility between the state and the urban is radical in nature. The state can only prevent the urban from taking shape. According to British Marxist geographer David Harvey, the right to the city is the freedom to make and remake our cities and ourselves. The right to the city is the right of the oppressed to take power and open new and better ways of urban living untethered by the state. As radical as these conceptions of the right to the city may be, that hasn't prevented the slogan from being co-opted by certain NGOs, international bodies, and municipal authorities, with entirely different ideological orientations and agendas, even going as far as to attempt to rewrite the history of the movement. These assimilationists routinely ignore the class struggle baked into Lefebvre's conception of the right to the city in favour of an approach that integrates the term into bog-standard policy with weak gestures, if any, against particular aspects of neoliberalism. Their de-radicalized version of the right to the city is, according to Sousa, the right to a better, more human life in the context of the capitalist city, the capitalist society, and on the basis of a reformed and improved representative democracy. The right to the city has gained ground in various environmentalist and urbanist movements, but attempts to exercise it in practice through the existing channels of municipal power have been limited in success which begs the question of if it is even possible to maintain the structures of the status quo while ostensibly upholding the right to the city. The answer should be obvious. The right to the city is a rallying cry of revolution, not reform. One clear exercise of this understanding can be seen in the resistance groups in France that stake claim on the spaces that the government and private sector seek to use for their own interests. The ZAD de Notre Dame de Landes is the most notable example where ecologists and activists claimed the proposed site of a new airport in 2009 as a zone d'autonomy at their defense, creating a self-organized area based on autonomy from capitalism, radical ecology, and degrowth, leading to the eventual cancellation of the project by the French government in 2018. The realities of urban life, the possibilities and limitations of city planning, and the rallying cry of the right to the city should all inform our approach to a solarpunk future. Welcome to the Lucio Costa School of Urban Planning, where you can learn how to design the perfect city, drawing from the excellent city layouts of Jakarta, Sao Paulo, Brasilia, New Orleans, Atlanta, and Dubai. 
Our courses have been tailored to give you the best urban design education possible. Learn how to create the perfect highway to cut right through a black community and how to push the poor people to the outskirts of the city they work in but can't afford to live in. And of course, what city would be complete without an unreliable public transit system? Our courses include The Land We're On, where you can learn to disregard the natural environment and its original inhabitants, Designing Sustainable Cities, where you'll learn how to grow trees on a concrete skyscraper, Urban Consulting Practice, where we'll show you how to kiss the feet of corporate lobbyists, and of course, Urban Planning and Politics, where we'll follow the James C. Scott Guide to Historically Successful Social Engineering, including the Administrative Ordering of Nature and Society by the State, a high modernist ideology that places confidence in the ability of science to improve every aspect of human life, a willingness to use authoritarian state power to affect large-scale interventions, and a prostrate civil society that cannot effectively resist such plans. Come access our world-class facilities, including the first-ever pedestrian hostile university campus and the latest version of base game unmodded city skylines available in our design lab. Our graduates have included the folks behind the line and every member of your municipal government or regional corporation. Apply today! In order to approach any radical transformation of the city, we must have a good grasp of our principles. In summary, I believe a successful solar punk city requires ecological integration, decolonial ethos, organic design, and participatory planning. By ecological integration, I'm referring to the conscious cultivation of a relationship with the land through the practice of deep listening with our senses wide open to the natural world. I'm talking about getting to know the trees that line your commute. I mean paying attention to the native and invasive flora and fauna that surround you. It's easy to fall into the habit of thinking that ecology exists outside of the city. But understanding urban ecology is vital in our struggle to protect the land and waterways of our environment. The city is also a habitat, constantly struggling towards greater biodiversity. It is part of various watersheds and it hosts a variety of communities, human and otherwise. The health of these communities is inextricably interlinked. Our urban space has vast ecological potential to contribute positively instead of negatively to the biosphere. A solar punk city should encapsulate third nature the reintegration of first and second nature. In the field of social ecology, first nature refers to the nature that is carried out through evolutionary processes. It simply is. Second nature is society, built off of ideas and turning ideas into reality. Second nature is mutable because it is informed by the way that we reason about the world and the choices that we make about how to construct it. Hierarchical society is only one form that our second nature can take. Through the proper integration of the ecology and human society, we can actualize revolutionary new human possibilities in both our social organization and in our city design. Some folks have already begun exploring those possibilities. The Transition Town Movement is a movement of communities coming together to reimagine and rebuild our world, one neighborhood at a time. Since 2005, across 48 different countries, thousands of community-led transition groups have been working for a low-carbon, socially just future with resilient communities, using participatory methods to imagine the changes we need, setting up renewable energy projects, relocalizing food systems, repairing and reskilling, and creating community and green spaces in towns, villages, cities, universities, and schools. Our urban transformations must be based in a decolonial ethos. I'm not just referring to symbolic decolonization, where we confront and take control of the visible and symbolic aspects of colonial domination represented in our street names, squares, rivers, and forests. I'm also referring to active efforts to combat the systemic inequalities that have been reinforced by urban layouts, asking questions like, who profits off of the industry of the city and who suffers the cancers of its effluent? Whose forests and communities are consistently cleared away or gentrified for the purpose of urban development? Which communities have access to green spaces and tree-lined streets? Where does the city get hottest and who lives there? How do we change that? 
what forms can reparations take for those victims of economic and racial segregation, gentrification, and displacement? By decolonization, I mean reclaiming the public for the public in common. A solar punk city must be designed to meet the organic needs of the members themselves as the utmost priority, above and beyond the whims of capital. As of late, this desire is manifested in the form of the car-free city movement and the 15-minute city movement. The car-free city movement advocates for cities that rely primarily on public transport, walking, or cycling for transportation, while either fully or partially prohibiting personal vehicles within the city limits. The similar 15-minute city movement advocates for mixed-use development that locates daily necessities and services such as work, shopping, education, health and leisure within an easily reachable 15-minute walk or bike ride from any point in the city. The 15-minute city might also involve the advocacy of remote work as a solution to many people's need to commute. Both movements aim to reduce car dependency, promote healthy and sustainable living, and overall improve the quality of life for city dwellers. However, they aren't all easy to apply, particularly to areas with an existing layout of urban sprawl. I don't believe cars can or should be completely eradicated from use, but I believe their uses need to be far more niche and situational than they are now. Human-focused city design goes beyond just transportation. A solar punk city will need to be designed in a way that reduces food miles through urban farming, produces local renewable energy, manages waste sustainably, caters to all facets of our health, cultivates social bonds, meets our aesthetic needs, and provides essential and desired goods and services through a library economy all in congruence with local conditions, local cultures, and local climate. Organic design should also reflect the potential of change. If the city is a living organism, how might it evolve in the future? All of these Solopunk city aims should be grounded in what I consider to be an essential principle. Self-management. A Solopunk city needs to be designed from the bottom up, not the top down through the direct participation and control of the residents themselves. For one, because if it isn't, it's not solar punk. For those, as American anthropologist James C. Scott highlighted in Seen Like a State, centrally managed social plans continuously misfire because they try to impose ordered and simplistic visions that fail to account for or accommodate the complex interdependencies that make up real life interdependencies that are not and cannot be fully understood. Scott identifies that these statist failures have four conditions in common. One, the administrative ordering of nature and society by the state. Two, a high modernist ideology that places confidence in the ability of science to improve every aspect of human life. Three, a willingness to use authoritarian state power to effect large-scale interventions. And four, a prostrate civil society that cannot effectively resist such plans. As he eventually concludes, these programs are characterized by their techni, a Greek word that he defines as expressed precisely and comprehensively in the form of hard and fast rules, principles, and propositions based on logical deduction from self-evident first principles. Techni is found most potently in the works of Frederick Taylor, an American engineer who fathered scientific management, an idea that would inform the organization of the factories of both Henry Ford and the Soviet Union. But what these programs to simplify and administer human behavior lack is metis, a Greek word for cunning intelligence, or more accurately, the wide array of practical skills and acquired intelligence one develops in response to a constantly changing natural and human environment. While techni is universalizing, metis is particular and contextual. In a word, it's street smart, the on-the-ground knowledge that top-down planners typically lack in determining city plans. Don't get me wrong, that's not to dismiss the validity of techni, but techni needs to be grounded in metis. 
planet needs to be participatory and grounded by the recognition of the inherent unpredictability of complex human and natural systems, because we don't fall neatly in line with the ideals of five-year plans. As an alternative to the conditions of status failure Scott outlines in his book, he provides these recommendations for those aiming to reconfigure their society. 1. Take small steps, because we can't know the consequences of our interventions in advance. 2. Favor reversibility, because irreversible interventions have irreversible consequences. 3. Plan on surprises, because we must be flexible enough to accommodate the unforeseen. And 4. Plan on human inventiveness, because you never know what ideas and insights will develop in the process of implementing various projects. A solarpunk city needs self-management in all spheres of life, from the way we labor, to the way we study, to the spaces we live in and leisure, with a variety of distributed decision-making forms and methods from consensus to liquid democracy, the details of which I've explored in past and future videos. From community land trusts, to library economies, to popular assemblies, what matters most is that those who are affected by decisions in a city have a say in those decisions and that we are able to draw from a diverse pool of both metis and techni, playing on the strengths, skills, knowledges and experiences of all the people. There's a variety of avenues of urban struggle open to us. In this regard, the anarchic tradition is rich with potential inspirations, from the squatting movements in Britain, Spain and Brazil, to the urban commoning efforts in Greece. In 1976, British anarchist Colin Ward published Housing, an anarchist approach, in which he described the efforts of the ex-servicemen's secret committee, whose vigilantes worked at night to break into unoccupied homes and install the homeless families and belongings of former servicemen who were being neglected by the government. As the movement secretary is quoted saying, I have told them, if you see a house, take it and let the Lord do its damnedest. We have started a movement which we hope and pray will spread over the length and breadth of the land. They understood that in the face of such neglect, they would only gain housing as a result of their own militant actions. And eventually, the Brighton Corporation conceded and promised officially requisitioned houses for its homeless population. Ward's final message was simple and direct. Act on your own. No reliance on the politicians, especially those who try to cash in on your success. Stick together and work on as big a scale as possible. Don't give up and don't give a damn for the authorities. If the vigilantes have these three prerequisites for successful action, independence, solidarity and determination, we can be sure that their movement will spread over the length and breadth of the land. Through the practices of occupation and squatting, there also exist vibrant urban struggles for housing in Spain and Brazil, arising from individuals and housing movements in response to the capitalist dynamics that have produced empty homes and homeless people. The urban struggle in Greece has arisen in response to the austerity measures wielded against the working class in the cities built overnight in the 50s, 60s and 70s. The process of enclosure, unregulated by plan and law stipulations for public space, eroded traditional communities, commodified housing, and promoted a sense of urban isolation. Many Greek cities still lack such facilities today, leading to a bubbling frustration that has at times erupted in a reappropriation of public space by horizontal collectives. After the police murder of 15-year-old Alexandros Grigoropoulos in December 2008, a wave of protests, demonstrations, and occupations of urban space led by students, immigrants, and the disenfranchised urban youth would highlight the alienation, exploitation, and exclusion built into Athens and work to actively transform the city through decentralized acts of reappropriation of urban space, including public building occupations, barricades, marches, spontaneous artistic events, and disruptions of traffic and commerce. Not limited by a struggle for reforms, the protesters sought to actively project their collective aspirations onto the urban landscape of Exarchia, giving birth to self-managed squats, 
common parks, social centers, and thousands of organizations, art collectives, and grassroots unions that would teach a generation about direct action and solidarity. The Greek urban struggle is about substituting public space with common space. It's about creating an organic and fluid space for the natural development of community bonds. It's about people seeing themselves as a group, questioning current conditions, identifying their collective and individual needs, and negotiating new forms of coexistence. Though many squats and occupations were only temporary, such liminal commons would still experiment with new spatial practices that could be applied to future struggles. In the wake of the protests, urban farming commons would arise in an abandoned military base in Thessaloniki and a former airport in Eleniko. Both sites were meant to be privatized, but in both cases, instead of demanding that their right of access to urban space was respected, citizens' movements self-enacted this right through commoning. Similarly, community self-defense movements would reconnect power for families who couldn't pay their energy bills, the potato movement would bring together the urban and the rural, cutting out oligopolistic millmen, and a network of self-managed solidarity clinics, workers' cooperatives, and consumer cooperatives would work to strengthen community resilience and autonomy. Unfortunately, the vision of Exarchia has been significantly curtailed by various political leaders, which should remind us that such urban struggles cannot be isolated from other broader fights. When you think of a Solapunk city, what do you see? I see people free from the binds of a 9 to 5 and the chokehold of their commute, basking in the variety offered by the urban atmosphere. I see wide avenues, varied in their use, murals painted over generations, windmills dotting the horizon, children playing in the street, and rooftop gardens spilling over their sides. What sounds fill your ears? I hear the bell ringing of bikes, the rumble of the tram along a boulevard lined with trees rustling in the wind, the absence of engines and horns, the chirps and songs of various birds filling the air, the hum of collective conversation in each nook and cranny of a public space, and the sounds of laughter and joy from a group of students studying the world around them. What do you smell? I smell the aroma of fresh baked bread, the tickle of pollen carried by the breeze, the sizzle of various homegrown street foods, the damp, earthy richness of the soil, and the fresh, salty air of a seaside city. We don't need to be bound by the irrational and violent impositions of the megapolis, which plunders the human spirit and the natural world. We have the potential to consciously reconstruct urban life in ways that foster balanced, well-rounded and harmonious communities that provide an open arena for our creative and social needs while correcting the rift between humanity and nature. Powered by local energy sources and carefully tailored to the ecosystems in which they are located, these eco-communities can bridge the divide between urban and rural. As Bookchin wrote, nature will not be reduced to a mere symbol of the natural a spectatorial object to be seen from a window or during a stroll. It will become an integral part of all aspects of human experience, from work to play. Only in this form can the needs of nature become integrated with the needs of humanity and yield an authentic ecological consciousness. Through a blend of ecological integration, decolonial ethos, organic design, and participatory planning, Informed by a legacy of urban struggles, we can radically reclaim our right to the city, together. All power to all the people. Peace. Hold on, hold on. Before you go, I have some big announcements to make. Firstly, shout out to Sean Bodley, who created this beautiful piece depicting a rather vibrant, tropical solarpunk city. He's also the artist behind this piece. He has all sorts of amazing climate art, including illustrations of Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, and you all should definitely support him on patreon.com slash Sean Bodley. Secondly, shout out to Anna Sorokina, who produced this wonderful work depicting a quieter corner of Solarpunk Utopia. 
She has some striking artworks on her website, which you should definitely go and support at anasorakinaart.com. Be sure to follow her on Instagram as well, at anasorakinaart. Also, shout out to Lil Bill for narrating this skit for this episode. His channel is also linked in the description below. The biggest announcement in question, however, is that the Sulapunk Art Collab is back. In case you didn't know, in 2021, I released a video featuring various artists in my community depicting Sulapunk ideas. It was such a great success, I'd like to do it again, this time with a theme. Bio region. I want each visual art piece submitted to reflect human societies in a solar punk setting that are constrained by ecological or geographical boundaries. A lot of solar punk artwork features temperate environments, but I'd love to see solar punk pieces in more diverse settings, such as deserts, shrublands, mangroves, temperate and tropical grasslands and forests, and much more. For more information, check out the Discord linked in the description below. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with fellow people. Thanks once again, of course, to the family, including our newest members Atlas Altera, Little Easy 100, The Garden Abolitionist Bookstore and Community Well, Liv, and Tom Hutchinson. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash same truth. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore St. True. Thanks again. Peace.